אוקיי. אוקיי, we can start. Uh, let's wait, I see that people are still coming in. Okay. <clears throat> Welcome everyone. Uh, we have today the great honor of having two scholars from the east part of the nation, from Florida, where the weather is even better than in California today. Uh, the topic of today's seminar is a very interesting uh, topic about fresh water used by terrorists, separatist groups, and other non-state actors as a weapon, tool, and target, general assessment of events and the South Asia case. So uh, to our surprise, water is not only a subject for survival of people, but also a subject of uh, terrorists trying to use it for reaching their objectives that are beyond water. So water has another good use, uh, quote unquote. Our speakers today, and this is the first time that our seminar has two speakers. So this will be a little bit of a challenge, but I see that they are very well coordinated. Uh, Dr. Tamana Ashraf, uh, who is uh, an adjunct instructor at the Florida International University, Department of Politics and International Relations. And Tamana, uh, works on security and hydropolitics uh, with focus on the case between India and Bangladesh. And recently she started working on terrorist attacks on dams in South Asia. The second speaker is Shlomi Dinar, who is the Associate Dean for Graduate Studies and Innovation in the Stephen Green School of International and Public Affairs and a professor in the Department of Politics and International Relations. And his research is in the intersection between international environmental politics, security, and negotiation. And his, uh, again, recent uh, probably joint work with Tamana is about uh, terrorist uh, attacks on water infrastructure uh, globally and with a focus on uh, South Asia. So with no uh, other interruptions, I will let the two speakers uh, start their presentation. Thank you very much, uh, Ariel, for, for that introduction. Um, it's a pleasure for us, for Tamana and myself to be here. Thank you, uh, Mehdi, for, for the invitation to speak. And Ariel, thank you for the invitation to speak uh, uh, in the School of Public Policy at, at UCR. It's a great honor. Um, and I, I'm sharing my screen here. Um, and uh, the, I know the title is, is, is quite, uh, is, is quite uh, uh, expansive. Uh, you'll understand in a second why that, that's expansive. And, and really what we've done here partly at the request of our hosts. Uh, but what we've done here is we have kind of combined two projects that we have been working on. Um, I, should, I should add that in addition to Dr. Ashraf and myself working on, 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 this, on these projects, another co-author that is not presenting with us today uh, is Dr. Jennifer Veyu. Uh, Dr. Veyu is at Tulane uh, University, and she's also a co-author uh, 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 on the project. Um, so what you'll see us do today, uh, let me just move to our next slide. What you'll see us do today is take both a global approach to, to the topic, and then we'll kind of go into a regional approach. The global approach I'm referring to here was a paper that uh, Jennifer Veyu and myself uh, co-authored uh, uh, it was published in, in the journal Terrorism and Political Violence, um, and that is kind of the global approach that I will be largely largely be focusing on. 
um, uh, giving you kind of a uh, uh, international perspective on the nexus between water and terrorism. And then uh, we will move to more of a, a regional perspective, the region that we're gonna be focusing on, as you saw from the title and what Ariel mentioned, is gonna be South Asia. And I won't tell you wh why South Asia just yet, uh, but uh, I will reveal why South Asia a little later from, from some of our results. Um, you can probably think ahead and, and guess why the focus will be on South Asia. Uh, but again, I'll reveal that uh, a, a little later. And Tamana will, will be, will be uh, focusing on kind of that South Asia regional perspective. So on the, on the global perspective, I will start with just to give you an idea of what we're going to be doing. I'll give, uh, we'll talk a little bit about the literature or lack thereof uh, uh, as it relates to the nexus between water and terrorism. Uh, we'll also, I'll also talk a bit about what we do, what uh, Jennifer and myself do in that global uh, uh, paper in the, uh, uh, in the paper that, that I mentioned uh, uh, in terms of a systematic analysis of uh, global or terrorist, water-related terrorist incidents, as, as we call them. We'll I'll tell you a little bit about the methodology that we develop to kind of uh, glean some of the information as it relates to the terrorist incidents that take place globally, as well as talk about some of these results through some maps. Um, uh, then uh, we'll transition, or uh, more accurately, Tamana will transition to, to, to the regional perspective on South Asia, provide, uh, provide you all with kind of the literature, the theoretical background that we needed to, uh, we needed to uh, create to be able to speak more specifically, right? Now that we're looking at this on a more regional level and asking more specific question, uh, we need to consult a, a, a more specific the, uh, a literature. So Tamana will provide that kind of a, a literature background as it relates to that nexus, and then look at uh, uh, some of the water-related terrorist incidents by focusing on India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. And again, you will soon hear why the focus not only on South Asia, but also why the focus on these three countries. And then we'll conclude with some concluding thoughts as well as some policy implications and then leaving, I think, uh, enough time for questions and answers. So let me, let me first of all begin, as I promised in the outline, with this, the nexus of water and terrorism. And if you look at the literature, right, at the academic literature in particular, I would say also the policy-related literature. In fact, I would argue that the policy-related literature is a little bit more advanced than the academic literature. But if you look at the, uh, at the academic literature as it relates to uh, um, water and security, well, I think that you will find that a lot of the attention uh, as it relates to water and security and, and kind of hydropolitics, as we like to call it, the politics of water or hydropolitics, really focuses on conflict and violence, if that's gonna be the focus, right? There's, I know there's also a focus on cooperation, but as it relates to conflict and violence, there's oftentimes a focus on the interstate context. Yes, there are some studies that look at the intrastate context, what happens within states as it relates to violence, but really not much, at least systematically speaking, on terrorism. Now, there are, of course, a few exceptions to to, to, to that focus. Um, and, and some of that, some of those exceptions include uh, Elizabeth Chalecki, who wrote a very, in our opinion, very seminal piece in, in 2002 on the links between uh, water and terrorism, looked at the aspect of environmental terrorism more broadly, and really brought to the fore this notion of water as a terrorist tool. Uh, some of you, some, some folks in the audience may also be very familiar with, with Peter Glick and his work. Uh, on, on the nexus between water and terrorism. And again, that is another exception, I would say, to the literature. But beyond those two studies, we don't quite see a whole lot on that particular nexus. Where we do see some other work is uh, largely from colleagues in, in engineering, uh, uh, in fact, who look at the vulnerabilities of, of physical water systems uh, to a terrorist attack. There's a lot of really interesting work on that. Uh, uh, in the literature, and that's certainly helpful uh, to build the case for looking at the nexus between water and terrorism. And I would also argue that the other exception 
uh, has to do with a few case studies. And I think the most prominent case study as it relates to the link between water and terrorism is that pertaining to ISIS. Uh, really at the height of its power, ISIS or ISIL, uh, depending on how you want to call the organization, uh, 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 had documented, there were, there were documented of, um, uh, incidents of ISIS and ISIL using water as a weapon, using water as a tool, using water as the goal for, uh, for governance, right? We all know that ISIS's main goal was to create the Khilafah, right? Uh, uh, and, and in order to create the Islamic State, right, the Khilafah, you have to also have infrastructure and you need to have water to supply your citizenry. So that was the goal of ISIS. So uh, uh, there, you know, we showcase here one particular example, but there are other interesting writings about how ISIS used water as a goal, as a weapon, and as a tool. So these are some of the exceptions. So despite the relative lack of, of literature on water and terrorism, uh, the policy community, as I alluded to earlier, actually emphasizes the links between water and terrorism quite nicely. Um, uh, uh, the first point that I make here is, is that the policy community makes, or if you will, policy publications as well, is this idea of the increasing vulnerability of states to terrorism, especially under conditions of climate change. Uh, right, Climate change is seen by the security community, by the intel community, by the defense community in the United States, but also in other countries as a threat multiplier. So to what extent, if you will, terrorists can leverage climate change and leverage how climate change impacts water to engage in terrorism. Um, uh, the policy community has also made reference to terrorist organizations use of water as a weapon of war, actually using that type of, of terminology. And also the policy community in, the, in its various writings and various reports has also referred to terrorist organizations' attempts to control water sources. Again, some of the same things that ISIS did quite well at the height of its, uh, of, uh, of its, uh, of its time in both Iraq and Syria. So we were very interested, we were very much uh, motivated by the literature that we did see, a little, a little uh, obviously motivated by the fact that, wow, let's, I mean, there could be, I think, a contribution we can make here, specifically systematically speaking, right, by, uh, uh, by trying to see what things look like globally in terms of water-related terrorist events. And to do that, we turn to an excellent source of information, a database called the Global Terrorism Database. Some, some who are watching may be familiar with the GTD. This is a, a database developed at the University of Maryland, maintained at the University of Maryland, uh, continues to be maintained at the University of Maryland. It's a fantastic source. And at the time when we did our study, uh, the periods of 1970 through 2016 were the ones available. Now there are a few extra years available, and, and, and Tamana will speak a little bit about that as we focus on South Asia. But we had about 170,000, over 170,000 global terrorism incidents. These are not water-related yet. These are 170,000 global terrorist-related incidents from 1970 and 2016 that were available in the GTD. And what, of course, we wanted out of those more than 170,000 uh, uh, incidents is to isolate the ones that are related to water. So the nice thing about the GTD is it did some of this work for us already. The GTD actually divides its incidents into various themes, which was very helpful. And in fact, they have a food and water theme, which was fantastic. So really help us, helped us out quite a bit. But what we found is um, we, we actually identified a lot, some events that were not part of the food and water category, but, the, but were clearly related to water. So what we also did is in addition to uh, leveraging that great categorization given to us by GTD, we also developed our own methodology of using keywords uh, to extract additional events beyond what the GTD made available through their category. And we were able to identify additional events, which were, I think was, was very, very important and very useful. What we also did, and I'll show you this in the next slide, what we also did is in order to begin to categorize the water-related terrorist events is we began to, what we also did is we created a codification of types of water-related terrorism, something I'll show you again in the next slide. And then we engaged in some uh, 
simple quantifications. What, what I'm about to show you is not, uh, you're not going to see any regression analysis or, 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 or causal relationships. That is, by the way, another uh, study that we, are, we, are, we, we would like to embark on. Really, the purpose of this study that we did was to really engage in some simple statistics, really a simple uh, a, a numerical uh, uh, calculations to kind of identify what was happening out there. Um, so what we're also going to show you is some quantifications or some percentages, some maps and, and, and analysis as it relates to uh, the, the codification of incidents, the categories, uh, the associated terrorist organizations, the countries that were implicated in these terrorist uh, events, the transboundary freshwater basins that were also implicated in, this, in, in the various uh, terrorist events. And then the last thing I'll show uh, is kind of four case studies, if you will. I will not go into great detail because we also have a part on South Asia we have to talk about, but really four case study in the form of what were the four major organizations from 1970 to 2016 that had the largest number of terrorist incidents? So that will come up a little later as well. So let me take you through the water-related uh, uh, terrorism categories. Remember, we, we, we identified our, 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 our water-related events, and now what we, what we wanted to do is we wanted to categorize them further under these various if you will, additional categories. And these were the categories essentially that we created based on the events that we identified, okay? So the categories include water as a weapon uh, and, and you have the various definitions right after those colons, uh, is, is a direct and indirect use of water resource to inflict harm or cause death. Uh, another category was water infrastructure, which is uh, uh, where physical pipes and plants and dams and reservoirs and other types of, of physical uh, um, uh, 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 infrastructure uh, that are necessary to maintain, deliver, store, and treat water resources. Essentially, water infrastructure that's under attack. Water-related people, at, at, first, at first glance, this might look, seem a little bit awkward, uh, but really what we mean here is uh, anyone that's working on or with water resources, whether that's, if you will, a water worker, some, a worker who works on water resources, someone who's building a dam, or even a minister that's responsible for the water ministry uh, of a specific country and how they have been attacked as well. And then we have a few other categories that you could look at what they are. Water is a grievance, water is collateral, and water transportation. I won't recite those, and you can certainly uh, read them as well. Um, so let me go through some of the results. Uh, uh, we've got about seven results from the global uh, analysis. And the first result was that water related terrorism happens all over the world, right? This is something, it's not confined to one region. Yes, some region have seen more terrorist events than others according to the GTD, certainly. However, what we find is that terrorist events happen all over the world. They're not confined to one or even two regions. And in fact, speaking of countries, uh, we found that 71 countries were host to these types of attacks. And if you like maps, uh, and if you're more of a visual person, you can kind of see what this looks like in terms of 71 countries, again, for that period of 1970 to 2016, okay? And what you're looking at is the number of incidents Okay, the number of incidents by country and, and, and you see here the color codes there on the bottom uh, as well. You can see some of the countries with some of the highest uh, water related uh, incidents, water related terrorism incidents, excuse me, from 1970 to 2016. Uh, again, remember what I said in my first slide, our focus on South Asia, our focus on India, Afghanistan and Pakistan. Hopefully you're kind, of see, you're kind of seeing why we turn to that regional focus, that country focus already from, from the colors. Another result that we, we found was that water-related terrorism increased overall from the Cold War to what we call the post 9-11 security world. What essentially we did is we created, we took the 1970 to the 2016 time period and we divided it into three other time periods. Um, and you can see here what the time periods are. We used, if you will, major political events to kind of guide us in how we were essentially, uh, we had the, uh, 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 the Cold War period, the, the post-Cold War period, and we also had the 
post 9-11 period as well. You can obviously that, see that the post 9-11 period registered the largest number of events. We can discuss what the reasons are might be here. I think there are a number of reasons and we certainly acknowledge some of the some of those reasons in the paper uh, that I spoke about earlier. Uh, but nonetheless, I think just uh, it's interesting to see that in the post 9-11 period, a larger number of, of incidents recorded by the global terrorism uh, database. Another result that I want to share with you is we found that there were about at least 675 water-related terrorist incidents recorded in the GTD, ranging from 1970 to 2016. Of these incidents, 3,391 people were either killed or reported as casualties. Now, I want to, of course, uh, um, mention that um, uh, among the more than 170,000 GTD terrorist events, 675 is a minuscule number. I agree and I acknowledge that, right? And certainly the number of people reported killed as casualties, uh, uh, um, uh, killed or reported as casualties being 3,391 300, compared to the much larger uh, number is minuscule. That is absolutely correct. But I still think, uh, right, it, it, it's, it's, it's quite interesting, right, uh, here to, to demonstrate how uh, uh, water is used as a weapon, as a target, as, as a tool, uh, um, uh, as a form of governance, um, despite, again, the relative small number compared to obviously the large number of, of terrorist incidents that have happened in the world, and of course the number of killed and those reported as casualties. I still, I still think there is certainly something very much, um, uh, very much uh, indicative here, especially given what Ariel mentioned in the very beginning of the lecture, that now this is becoming, is being used as a tool, as a political tool, right? Another, if you will, form of a, a, a political tool to achieve some sort of a political outcome or some sort of an outcome. Uh, again, uh, uh, this table uh, kind of reiterates some of the stuff I just mentioned. Uh, uh, the number of terrorist organizations involved in water terrorism being 124. Um, uh, incidents involving water-related terrorism, 675. I know we mentioned that. The number of people dead due to those terrorist incidents, the number of people wounded due to those terrorist incidents, and GTD, uh, Global Terrorism Database, creates a intensity score, which is basically taking this number, this number, and this number, and simply adding them together. That's all this means here, the 4,660. Another result that I think is quite interesting, uh, but perhaps maybe not so surprising to some of you, maybe it is, is that water-related terrorism most often targets water infrastructure. Remember, we looked at those categories, WW, WI, WP, WG, WC, WT. Well, what we find is that water-related terrorism most often targets water infrastructure. That is followed by water people or by people who work with water, remember, in an official capacity such as a minister or even dire uh, directly as a pipeline worker or security officer who is, uh, if you will, guarding a dam site, right? So that I think is something also very, very instructive uh, to, uh, that we found. And if you wanted to kind of see what that simple distribution in terms of numbers looks like, uh, you could see what uh, where water infrastructure is in terms of uh, uh, water-related terrorism incidents, where water people is. Remember I mentioned it's the second, it was a second uh, largest category, followed by water, um, water transportation. This is infrastructure that's usually above uh, water resources, like a bridge, for example, um, as well as uh, um, the next one would be water as a weapon, followed by uh, water, uh, uh, collat water as collateral and a water grievance. Another finding, and I, I know I kind of mentioned that earlier, uh, but here's a little bit more information for you, is that the global terrorism database, which we used, identifies 124 separate terrorist organizations um, that have some association with water-related terror events. I mean, that's, a pretty, I think, a pretty large number. 124 separate terrorist organizations have engaged in some form or fashion in a water-related terror event. Now, yes, yeah, some of these have only engaged in one of those events and others have engaged in 20 or 30, 
But nonetheless, I think it's very, very interesting to see that you have 124 separate organizations engaging in some form of water-related terror event. Of these, we isolated four organizations in particular, FARC, uh, this is in Latin America, uh, Colombia, uh, ISIS, ISIL, which was very active as we know in Syria and in Iraq, the Shining Path in Peru, the Taliban, this is the, uh, this is the Taliban in Afghanistan that I'm referring to here because we know that there's also the Pakistani Taliban. Uh, and we looked at their tactics. And when I say by tactics, I, uh, what I mean is this, what in terms of all the incidents, where does the FARC fall in terms of the categories? And you can see that the FARC, it's pretty, you know, there's kind of a, a distribution is all over the place, but you can see the water as collateral for the FARC was the, was, was the larger, largest percentage. The FARC was very keen on uh, um, targeting uh, oil pipelines, but those oil pipelines, when they exploded, the oil would seep into river basins or fresh water reservoirs. So there is, if you will, the kind of the water collateral connection. Uh, the Shining Path, on the other hand, also in South America, in this case in, in Peru, uh, also targeted water infrastructure quite heavily when, when it came to water-related terrorist events. Uh, notice that the ISIL, also the same, ISIL was very much focused on, on water infrastructure when it came to their attacks. And notice when it comes to the Taliban, however, and Tamana will speak a little bit more about that, um, uh, in the case of Afghanistan, Taliban's concentration of water-related terrorist events was against water people, specifically as it relates to officials in the water sector. Um, it this wouldn't be a, a good uh, uh, a lecture on hydropolitics without looking at some basins, right? So I'm, uh, Tamana and myself are from the disciplines of international relations. We're all, we're very much focused on countries and borders. But as we know, in when it comes to hydropolitics, when it comes to water, uh, geographers in particular, uh, there is a tendency to also look at basins. Um, and um, when we map the results uh, and group the GTD incidents by region, I'm sorry, this is region, not, 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 not basin. So this is the region. Um, the highest number of incidents, the, the basins come later, my apologies, the slide after this. The highest number of incidents was in South Asia. So again, remember what I said, the, the, the answer to the question would come now. Again, hopefully you're seeing why we're going to be focusing on South Asia in a minute with Tamana, had about 208 incidents out of that total. That South Asia was followed by the Middle East and North Africa which was then followed by South America with 121 incidents. And if you're curious on how this looks globally more so, this is what it looks like. South Asia, MENA, the Middle East, North Africa, South America, Sub-Saharan Africa, Southeast Asia, Central America and the Caribbean, Eastern Europe, and so on and so forth. But again, you can see that South Asia takes the cake for this time period when it comes to the number of incidents. And here is my, my basin slide. Sorry, I got a little ahead of myself there before, is we also mapped the water-related terrorism events by transboundary freshwater basins and identified top five basins that saw the most number of incidents. And they include the Indus, the Ran of Kutch, which you may not have heard of, uh, uh, the Helmand, the Amazon, and the Tegis Euphrates. And again, if you are a map person, here in a way are the basins those five basins that I mentioned earlier, one, two, three, four, and uh, five. And this is kind of the distribution of the events based on the uh, events. And again, here on the bottom, you can see how the events are distributed. Um, I am going to turn it over now to my colleague, uh, Tamana Ashraf, to kind of focus on the regional study. And Tamana, whenever you tell me to switch slides, I will just go ahead and do so. All right. Um, thank you, Dr. Dinar. As Dr. Dinar kind of set up the um, forum for me, um, as his uh, informative map indicated, that um, throughout the period that he mentioned, which, which was from 1970 up until uh, 2016, uh, South Asia was one of the regions that saw the most um, terror related incidents. Um, one interesting uh, statistics that I came across um, was from the UN Water Report of 2019, uh, which um, 
stated that water use has been increasing worldwide by about 1% every year since the 1980s. And this growth has been driven by a combination of population growth, socioeconomic development, and of course, changing consumption patterns. Um, water scarcity is evident, strongly evident in developing parts of the world, South Asia, for example. Therefore, it is understandable as to why water can fuel both conflict and cooperation. The 2019 study conducted by um, Dr. Jennifer Veyu, Dr. Swami Dinar, uh, focused on water-related terrorism incidents using the uh, Global Terrorism Database, as um, Dr. Dinar mentioned. And their findings indicated that between 1970 and 2016, South Asia has seen the most water-related incidents. That interesting finding motivated our latest project that solely focus on South Asia, namely um, India, Pakistan, and um, Afghanistan. Right, if you can change the slide. Thank you. Um, right, um, so the dominant and most uh, public rationale behind the construction of these conspicuous freshwater infrastructures, aka dams, uh, relates to economic development. Um, the construction of dams provide economic development opportunities to countries and give the political uh, elites the opportunity to expand their powers and interests, which include state building uh, and consolidating state, author uh, state authority in areas populated by uh, ethnic minorities and of course, indigenous population. This is evident in cases like the uh, Southeastern uh, Anatolian project. Um, as this multi-billion dollar project expanded over the years, uh, it became a symbol of not only a, of a modern Turkey, but also as a panacea for the Kurdish resistance. Um, the understanding was that um, economic development under the uh, Southeastern um, Anatolian project would solve the Kurdish problem. The, um, along with that uh, Southeastern uh, Anatolian project, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which has seen a lot of uh, media coverage over uh, in recent years, um, uh, the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam too has become more than just a project for uh, poverty alleviation. Uh, the building of the dam has become somewhat of a, a patriotic cause. Um, along with economic development, uh, literature also includes that um, um, the promotion of water infrastructure projects can also become a symbol of do um, domination. Uh, often these large projects strategically uh, are, are strategically located in areas where state authority is challenged. Uh, thus, these projects can become means of counterinsurgency. Uh, going back to the Southeast, uh, Southeastern Anatolian project, many of the dam constructions under these projects were constructed in the Kurdish regions of Eastern Turkey. Uh, and the project over the years displaced around uh, over uh, 350,000 people, forcing them to assimilate into the uh, larger Turkish society. Um, similar situation was also seen in China where uh, its dam projects uh, ranging from the years 1980s and 1990s um, focused, uh, these projects focused in mainly in central and uh, western China. Uh, and these areas were not uh, populated by uh, Han Chinese uh, people. Uh, as the state asserts itself uh, through dam pro project in areas where its authority is not firmly established, a terrorist separatist insurgent um, organizations can target the projects to undermine state authority. Going back to the uh, Southeastern Anatolian project, the uh, Kurdistan Workers' Party or PKK targeted the Lisu Dam uh, and the um, Sylvan Dams between uh, 2014 and 15. Um, however, sometimes these uh, militant organizations may require or receive uh, external support as neighboring state may have interest in, in a shared uh, river basin. Throughout the 1980s and uh, 90s, the PKK uh, received support from the Syrian government, which was threatened by the construction of the um, Ataturk Dam. Uh, additionally, uh, Syria allegedly 
supported the um, Armenian ticket army for the liberation of Armenia uh, in an effort to destroy the um, Editor Dam in 1986, which was uh, foiled. Um, more recently, Ethiopia ha has alleged cooperation between um, Egypt and Eritrea to uh, use rebel groups, uh, more specifically the Bani Shagul, uh, Gumuz People's Liberation Movement, uh, in order to un undermine um, uh, undermine the uh, construction efforts of the uh, Grand uh, Ethiopian Renaissance Dam. If you can change the slide. So based on the existing literature um, and uh, media coverage, we argue that the state initiates the um, water infrastructure projects like dams in the name of economic and uh, national development, uh, which can sometimes lead to different forms of domination by state actors, often over ethnic minorities or groups that are challenging state authority. State agents can use the water infrastructure projects as a way to consolidate uh, and reinforce their authority, furthering their political and uh, security interests. Since these projects are often located in um, areas where the state is, the, its authority is challenged, these projects become flashpoints of violence um, between the state and separatists, insurgents, and terrorist actors in their quest to resist the state. If you can change the slide. Um, all right, so here I will speak to a given overview of the um, situations in um, Pakistan, India, and Afghanistan, uh, outlining some of the interesting findings and the uh, underlying factors that fuel um, the conflict related to dams between state agents and um, that of separatist insurgents or um, terrorist organizations. Um, our project uh, showcases terrorist attacks on dams and the government's suppression of terrorist groups insurgents um, and um, their attacks on dams and civilian opposition from the years 2002 to uh, 2019. So um, as Dr. Dinar spoke uh, before, the global analysis focused on the years between 1970 up until uh, 2016. However, when we focused on, uh, on the South Asia as a region, our focus was uh, the years between 20, uh, 2002 and 2019. We wanted to explore whether the 9-11 um, attack and the subsequent war on terror had any effect on terrorist attacks on water infrastructure in South Asia. Uh, and uh, of course, our uh, three case studies include India, Pakistan, and Afghanistan. So starting with India, the, one of the main challenges uh, facing India is the overall insecurity in its north uh, eastern state. So northeastern state is a uh, is a relatively secluded part of India, connected by a narrow strip of land uh, known as the Shiligori Co Corridor, uh, sometimes colloquially referred to as the Chicken Neck. Uh, it's basically a, a narrow corridor of uh, that's. 20 kilometers across, right? So it's very easy to, um, um, it's very difficult uh, for the, uh, the government, the central government in New Delhi to um, connect to the people in these uh, states, um, which is again, a group of seven states that, that's part of the Northeastern states. Um, and so understandably, um, over the years since uh, India's independence in 1947, India has seen challenges, resistance uh, coming from various tribes, indigenous tribes uh, from these um, parts. And um, also these part, uh, the various indigenous tribes uh, in the Northeastern states, they often speak different languages and they also have their own uh, form of belief that is, uh, different from the uh, from that of mainland uh, India. 
right? So therefore, over the years, uh, India has seen armed factions of various ethnic groups in these regions uh, uh, that have expressed nationalist uh, aspirations and they want statehood. Uh, the New Delhi government has a history of taking hardline approach to tackle with uh, separatist movements and even uh, in, in multiple times, I have resorted to uh, militarizing uh, the region, including the dam sites. The Tipai Mook Dam in 2008, for example, was, a, was militarized by the central government. Um, if you can uh, change the slide, I want to show the, yes. The Tipai Mook Dam in 2008 uh, was militarized as a response to the Hamar People's Convention's attack to protest uh, the government takeover of their lands, right? Um, for the central government, uh, the government uh, the dams are part of state building in these areas of separatist movements. And of course, the central government uh, conducts these projects in the name of uh, development uh, and to generate revenue, to alleviate poverty, um, even if the project has been a failure. The Singda Dam, for example, uh, has failed to supply water uh, but the Manipur government, uh, Manipur is a state, Indian state, um, but the Manipur government wants to transform it into a tourist site um, uh, to generate revenue, despite its failure to provide water to irrigate the lands. However, of course, the local communities see this as a land grab by the central government. But if you can go back to the other slide. The, yes, thank you. Um, in contrast to, India, the dam-related uh, terrorist incidents in Pakistan are more complex since multiple uh, domestic and foreign actors are involved. The central government faces uh, challenges from the Balochi sect of the population. The portion of the ba Balochi population, um, a portion of the uh, Balochi population has, a, has long held nationalist aspirations uh, that the central government uh, constantly tries to suppress. Um, the Baloch Liberation Movement uh, target dams as a way to attack the state and anyone outside of their community. Uh, the Baloch militant groups think that, that foreign actors like foreign workers, um, like mainly like Chinese workers, um, are working with the Islamabad government to rob them of their natural resources and to even change the demographics of their, of their region. Uh, terrorist groups have also targeted Pakistani government workers ha and have used them as bargaining chips. Um, if you can go forward two slides, please. Yes. Um, like, uh, for example, the Tehriki Taliban uh, kidnapped eight Gomozam dam workers in uh, 2012, uh, demanding the workers in exchange for arrested um, terrorists. Dam failures have also fueled local discontent against the state. The cyclone, after the cyclone, um, after a cyclone in 2007 that uh, caused heavy flooding uh, around the Mirani Dam area, uh, tension between the government and the Balochi people intensified. However, the locals were apprehensive about the project um, even before the cyclone. So when uh, during um, uh, former President Parvis Musharraf's uh, administration, when he visited the area, rockets were shot during his visit in 2005, which was an indication of this apprehension, of this tension between uh, the, the local population and the central government. In other words, building dams without the goodwill of the locals increases the likelihood of violence, increases uh, their dislike of, the, of these uh, dam projects. And in addition, dam failures um, uh, also solidifies their belief that the government does not represent their interests. And if you can go back to the, yes, thank you. Um, so moving on to uh, Afghanistan, like Pakistan, dam related terrorist incidents have multiple domestic and foreign actors involved. Uh, contemporary Afghanistan has been the ground zero for the war on terror. Uh, so both foreign and domestic actors are, we have seen that, for, that both 
foreign and domestic actors uh, being active to um, hinder uh, Afghanistan's dam projects. Due to the war on terror, the, the United States and its Western allies um, played a role in building Afghanistan's dam. Uh, the Afghan dams uh, became strategic tools of Western powers. And of course, they also became strategic tools of terrorist groups uh, to win the war on terror. The Western powers defended, built and defended the uh, Kazaki Dam from uh, Taliban multiple times throughout the 2000s. If you can go forward. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, for the Taliban, attacking the Kazaki Dam meant that they were attacking anti-Islam West. Since uh, Afghanistan shares river water with Iran, uh, for example, the Herat, the Helmand River, um, dams, dam, dams building or building dams on these rivers can come in conflict with Iran's interests. In 2010, uh, th the Taliban claimed responsibility for killing uh, the uh, a governor of uh, Chisti -e Sharif district in Afghanistan, who was a key supporter of the Afghan-India Friendship Dam, AKA uh, also known as the Salma Dam, the Afghan dam, uh, sorry, the Afghan government uh, saw, saw this incident, saw this murder as uh, Iran's wider attempt to sabotage um, development in the Herat province and to keep the country unstable so that the US, uh, the United States is more focused on the war on terror in Afghanistan and less on Iran. Um, along with accusing Iran, uh, Afghanistan government also accuses Pakistan of trying to sabotage Afghanistan's development by aiding terrorist groups like the Taliban. In 2007, for example, um, 700 fighters crossed into Afghanistan to attack the uh, Kazaki Dam. And, um, uh, and the governor blamed Pakistan of, for, uh, of supporting them. So I will move on to the conclusion now. Thank you, Tamana. Uh, we, we're, we, uh, I'll take the first few points on the conclusion and then Tamana mm -hmm. will close it off. Um, so just by way of conclusion, uh, we wanted to, of course, conclude by saying that um, and again, Ariel, you kind of said this in the beginning, water-related terrorism is a type of terrorism, uh, certainly, uh, but I, I think that we're still at a point where it's not yet well studied, as we, as we could see from, uh, uh, you know, from the literature, um, uh, uh, widespread and real and present threat. Uh, and, and the tactic, as we've at least seen from some of the numbers that we've shown, appears to be uh, on the rise. Uh, apropos of the, the, the global analysis, we had developed a method to categorize and codify different types of water-related terrorism. Uh, since targets vary, those again, the, those w, the WI, the WW, the WT, and some targets may impact water, albeit indirectly. That would, if you recall, was the water collateral, for example. Water-related terrorism exacerbates existing issues uh, in basins at risk. I think that understanding how terrorists use water as a weapon of war, right, that could be a pretty, a, a pretty expansive term, uh, may help policymakers design specific policies to respond. I think this is even more so now as we look at the increasing threats of climate change uh, and how this could, be, this could be a threat multiplier and how terrorist organizations may use this uh, 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 as, as another type of weapon, so to speak. And again, uh, what I think is quite interesting and, and hence the, re the, the, the reason for our second uh, study is that the highest number of incidents occur in South Asia. Um, so based on our analysis uh, of South, the attacks in South Asia, we have seen uh, three factors that are fueling te terrorist acts in uh, South Asian dams. Um, first, all three states face legitimacy challenges from minorities and in indigenous uh, groups, uh, and also um, challenges and resistance coming from radical groups, militant groups, and dam projects offer an efficient way 
to maintain their, their presence, meaning the state's uh, presence in the area and suppress uh, these groups. Second, um, militant groups target the BAM projects to resist state power and assert their own political agenda. And lastly, dam projects uh, uh, these South in these South Asian countries uh, often become entangled in the foreign policy of the state of, uh, an, against a neighboring riparian. Mainly, we have seen that in, in um, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and some uh, to a lesser degree in uh, India as well. Great. Thank you for listening. Yeah. Thank you very much, uh, both of you. This is very interesting presentation, and uh, thanks for giving us this information. And now we move forward to the questions. Anyone, they have, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q and A or the chat box. Uh, we have a we have few questions. Let's start with the first one. It says uh, this is by Ariel Dinar says, are there incidents of sabotage, sabotage of dams that were motivated by the group downstream that was supposed to be negatively affected by the dam once completed? So within a, within a region, the down, downstream attacking the dam upstream. Well, I, I think one of, one of those organizations that come to mind would be something like the PKK, for example, right? Especially in Eastern Turkey. Uh, yes, uh, a lot of the Turkish dams are, a lot of the dams in Turkey are built in, if you will, a, the Kurdish area. But, um, you know, one of the issues, uh, uh, and I think Tamara mentioned this uh, when she referred to the PKK in the context of the literature review, is that some of the dams would essentially flood areas downstream that were populated by Kurds. Right. So that, of course, also had a role to play in motivating, if you will, uh, some of those some of those attacks, at least in, in the case of the PKK. Off the top of my head, the, P, the PKK comes to mind. Uh, I'm sure there, you know, there were there were others as well. But the PKK, I think, is one uh, mm -hmm. one good example of uh, your question, Ariel. Uh can I also add something? Uh, apart from a militant or radical organization, um, building of dams uh, have also fueled connections or networkings between civilian uh, um, organizations, NGOs, uh, namely the when the Tifaimuk uh, dam was um, being um, talked about or discussed or or or. or um, the government was taking renewed approach to um, start or begin the Tifai Muk Dam. It created, of course, local discontent in India. However, it also created uh, concerns um, in uh, downstream in Bangladesh um, that foster, uh, that promoted actually connections between NGOs, civilian groups, um, to kind of uh, increase awareness and also increase activism on this issue. So apart from radical groups, there's also been concerns and greater connections or networking coming from uh, civilian groups. Thanks very much. Um, mm -hmm. There's another question is that uh, you have not analyzed it, but do you believe uh, that terrorism incidents or, or let's say conflicts uh, to be a little bit broader will be higher in a climate change induced water scarcity regions, countries, basins, right? Uh, we see some of this in the news already that the conflicts are rising because of the water scarcity. Uh, but do you see that? Do you have uh, data or, or, or um, uh, discussions to offer? <laughs> Great question, and you're right. We did, we don't analyze right the the clear connection. And sorry, I stopped sharing my screen because I wanted to to to, to bring up uh, the article uh, that was based on the global analysis, only because there's some uh, some great information. For example, Al Shabaab, for example, uh, and, and again, we we talk about other examples in the global analysis paper. But Al Shabaab, for example, 
uh, 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 essentially stop the water supply into one of the villages in Somalia. So an answer to the question is, I think that is the fear. I think the fear is that in a climate change, uh, uh, in, in where, where climate change has more impact, right, uh, on drought in particular, uh, but also in terms of water variability, in terms of more rain. Uh, yes, the fear is that that will be leveraged, right? That's the whole mm -hmm. idea of the threat multiplier. The mm -hmm. terrorist organizations will essentially see that uh, as, as a key way of, um, uh, you know, of, of engaging in some aspect of power manipulation, right? Mm -hmm. And climate change, if you will, will add to their ability to do so. Right, and certainly make more populations vulnerable. Tamana, I don't. I'm sure you have some specific yeah. thoughts about this in your context, in the, your regional context. Um, well, I wanted to mention a, a, an interesting finding that's actually outside of my region that also kind of adds to your answer there. Uh, for example, uh, Boko Haram has utilized the um, water scarcity uh, issue in Lake Chad. Uh, Lake Chad has seen gradual decrease in water uh, availability since the 1960s and Boko Haram has, uh, I mean, which of course le has led to loss of livelihoods uh, for the people in, in the region. And Boko Haram has taken advantage of this situation of their desperation to uh, increase recruitment. Um, and uh, coming from my region, um, I can speak to uh, Pakistan, for example, where um, various dams or, or projects have, have actually generated local discontent and, and which actually uh, increases the leverage of um, actors like water tankers, uh, private um, water suppliers, uh, they can now um, voice their concerns, stop the supply if they want, if they have, uh, if, if they have certain complaints that, and that also creates discontent in the local population, not against the, Water tankers, but against the government. Thank you. We are seeing some of that uh, in Iran right now, and uh, mm -hmm. um, that's uh, directly related to water. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, the last question uh, is that: uh, What kind of policy responses uh, to prevent? or reduce the terrorist attacks or the conflicts could you offer? Or have you seen that the policymakers, you know, um, changing their approach or anything that you can offer in terms of policy, mm -hmm. both for the terrorist attacks, but also the rising conflicts due to water issues? I don't know, Tamani, you want to go first on this one? Yeah, I mean, I see uh, the main one of the main ways that um, the governments in my region, uh, in our region, South Asia, uh, can address or at least try to address um, um, is through um, greater participation. Since these uh, discontents are coming from minorities, ethnic minorities that feel that their their voice their interests um, are not being represented by the government so maybe increasing representation greater participation of the of of the uh, for example the baluch uh, population um, I, I think that would um, be useful in uh, reducing the discontent and ultimately violence uh, against the government against uh, these dam infrastructures You know, many. The only thing I I'll, 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 I can add um, here to what I think Tamana already mentioned is the fact that first of all, just the first of all, the recognition that water among men, that water again is here utilized as a tool of power, right? Mm -hmm. Both by states, but also by other organizations, right? So not only terrorist organizations, but also insurgent groups and and rebel groups. Right. So again, water here is being used as some sort of a tool. Um, and you're going to have some organizations that are going to have their specific um, terror related motivations that see the use of water as a clear tool. Right. There's not a whole lot of conversing and discussions you can have, if you will, with ISIS. Right. If you will. 
Uh, however, there are other cases where there are certainly other um, uh, separatist groups or uh, minority groups that are uh, organized minority groups, where as Tamana mentioned, have to be included in the conversation uh, when states are, if you will, about to engage or build a large dam or when it comes to uh, global financial organizations like the World Bank that's going to pour money, uh, provide money for states to build dams, there has to be, and I know that's happening already, but there has to be perhaps more of a concerted effort on making sure that ethnic minorities or other groups are part of the conversation so that there's not that motivation, if you will, for that violent backlash. So I think that's another way of preventing, reducing the, mm -hmm. the, the level of violence over water on the intra, in, intra within intra state level. Thank you, Tamana and Shlomo. Well, I mean, this is, you know, I like this to go for hours, but, uh, but unfortunately we have to stop here. Uh, we are reaching the 1 p.m. and uh, we are losing the audience, but the an online link will be available right after the seminar. You can share it with your contacts. I will definitely share it with my contacts and, you know, watch it and uh, learn more about this. Thanks again for participating in our seminar series. Uh, I hope you have a great break coming up and a good holidays. And uh, thanks for for the for, for participating during the uh, fall quarter in water seminar series. We will be back in January uh, with the winter uh, water seminar series. Um, are you all? Do you want to add anything else? Uh, or no, we just, just to thank yeah. the two the two speakers for a very fascinating. Uh, Seminar, you know, everything that re is related to water is fascinating, but this is in particular very fascinating. And maybe, you know, they have a lot of data. Yes. <laughs> well, as I, as I kind of mentioned, and I know, you, I know you have to go, but as I mentioned, some of the, one of the first questions, or the second question that was asked, the links to climate change, right? This is where a much more system, uh, a much more rigorous, econo economically rigorous study can really, I think, be applied where we could ask the questions, are there uh, 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 correlations between water variability and heightened terrorist incidents, for example, right, to get at climate change? Um, and, and that's, in, in fact, uh, Taman and I had a conversation right before getting on, is that in addition to our South Asia paper, which we're, you know, now is under review, uh, we would, you know, we definitely want to explore um, uh, 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 that, you know, a more econom econometrically rigorous paper that asks some of these questions. Um, so uh, that's you know another part of this project as well. Thanks very much. Uh, uh, we will follow up with the emails and um, yeah, that would be uh, it's just a fascinating topic, I think. <laughs> Mehdi, are you are you a, are you a, are you a, 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 what what they call in in co-authored groups? Are you a stats guy? Kind of, yes. <laughs> oh, okay. Yes. We have our guy. We have our guy, Tamana. We have our next co-author. No, the marriage, we have just, we have just uh, established the marriage. <laughs> right, we have the groom. <laughs> that's the hope. That's the hope. With this water seminar series, we hope to establish more, more of the connections that benefits everyone. And also, um, you know the region because uh, we we are most of our seminars are focused on, on California but uh, but these kind of seminars a lot of people are interested in it because it brings experience because in California of course we have all this water infrastructure and the fear of the conflict plus terrorist attacks right so uh, this is for sure something that is interest to our region yeah. all right well i will definitely reach out to you directly Mehdi. if you, even if it's of interest yeah. we can certainly talk about this project that we've been talking about and, and we can take it from there okay thanks thanks for um thanks for the seminar and have a great rest of the day thank you so much thank Bye. you for